Okay. Okay. Uh, so first, I just give a brief overview of the talk. There will be six parts. And the first part is about before Bernhard Carlgren. And the second part is Carlgren and the 20th century. Uh, the third part is about the six vowel hypothesis, the, or the let's say the those scholars who subscribe to the six vowel hypothesis, and then I'll let it translate this before I go on to the next one. Okay. It's not correct, yeah. Well, let's try it. What I'll do is just leave out all the names, I think. Yeah. And then it might still be helpful. So we'll try it on this next one. Uh, so let's still try it. Okay, so then in the fourth, in the fourth section, I talk about the older generation of currently active scholars. And then in the fifth section, the younger generation of currently active scholars. And then I conclude with some comments about bridging the gap between philology and uh, historical phonology. Okay. So I start at the beginning, the earliest uh, Western scholars who worked on uh, old Chinese reconstruction before Bernhard Carlgren. So uh, uh, Georgi Orlandi has written some articles about this. And I was just reminded actually that he uh, studied at this university. So uh, you all know him better than I do, I think, yeah. Uh, so he's been writing about the history of well, Western uh, study of uh, Chinese historical linguistics. And in particular, he's written about the contributions of these three men. So Joshua Marshman, Joseph Edkins, and I don't know how to say the name exactly, Zenone Volpicicelli. <laughs> so I've read his articles. These guys mostly worked on Middle Chinese. And as far as I can tell, nothing very important they did about Old Chinese. So I just say this was the beginning, yeah, uh, but nothing really to say that I can tell uh, that is still valuable today. So I, I move on to the first scholar who I think uh, did something that's still useful today. Uh, so this is Georg van der Gabelens, uh, and he's a German, yeah. And uh, he, he wrote this big uh, Chinese grammar, and in it, he points out that uh, there are some characters that begin with uh, a velar. I think it's the chen mu. <laughs> uh, that are used to, so used in a, a Sheshang relationship with a character uh, that has the lai mu. Yeah? So then he, uh, well, that's what this slide says. So then he said, maybe it's evidence for a cluster. Uh, so this one, I don't know, Jing, maybe, Jing, yeah. Yeah, he thinks it comes from Tram. Uh, so that's a good idea, I think, yeah. We still believe it today, I think. Yeah. So he's the first person from the West who had a you know good idea about old Chinese reconstruction. Okay, so then I move on to the next one, August Conradi. And he also worked on uh, Tibetan, actually. I used his work a lot. Uh, so, and he has an amazing mustache. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, so he, uh, I mean, we'll come back to this idea. It's the origin of the tone, yeah? 
So he thought that maybe the Chusheng comes from a final E. Yeah. Now, we still think that. Uh, he didn't have a very good reason for it. Uh, his reason was this word for goose, which I think is a, uh, is it? No, un, maybe, yeah. This word for goose, this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so in Middle Chinese, it's uh, ngang, yeah. Uh, and he thought maybe it's related to the word gu, which comes from, in Indo-European, yeah. So then he thought, Maybe this chu uh is the et, yeah. So that was his idea, and uh, whether or not he had a good reason for thinking it, it was right, yeah. So uh, I think those are the two scholars who, uh, before Karlgren, had some useful uh, ideas that we still believe today. So that's it for uh, Conradi. So then we come to Cargon. I think probably everyone knows who is Cargon. I don't need to say very much about him. Uh, he was Swedish, and he uh, um, used the rhyme table tradition to study the different dialects in the 1920s. You know, he was he went on horseback from village to village, uh, trying to listen to what people said for different characters. Uh, and I think that was his first contribution was trying to bring together the study of the dialects and the study of the rhyme tables. Uh, and then a little bit later, he studied the works of the Qing uh, phonologists like Duan Yu Tsai and whatnot. And he's the first Western scholar who uh, studied the Qing phonologists. Okay, so. Oops, we go forward. Here we go. So he has this book with lists all of his reconstructions of, I think, about 9,000 characters. I'm not sure. Uh, Grammatica Recensa. Recensa is the second edition. Uh, so I guess it's just called Hanwen Tian. Uh, but his reconstructions are strange let's say yeah you've probably all seen them and you recognize that they're strange many many vowels many strange symbols you never know how to understand it yeah so you know an important pioneer i think a major turning point in the reconstruction of chinese uh old chinese but maybe uh very out of date yeah so that's Kalgren. Now, uh, I move on to André-Georges Audricourt. Uh, he actually, very interesting person. He was trained as a agricultural scientist. And that's why here he's smelling some uh, wheat or something, yeah? And then he uh, spent uh, a lot of time in Vietnam as part of the French colonialism. Uh, and uh, I think mostly worked on languages in Vietnam. But he has two important contributions to uh, Chinese historical phonology. One of them he is famous for, one of them he is not so famous for. Uh, and then I would generally say that uh, this method of internal reconstruction is something he brought to Chinese linguistics. And in general, the French, are good at internal reconstruction. The Germans are good at comparative reconstruction, at least in the early 20th century. So let's look at his two major ideas. Okay, so the first one, uh, and you'll have to just, uh, you'll have to just uh, follow along in the translation, but he proposed that some uh, hooko syllables uh, in particular, in certain rhymes, and I, I list them there, that they come from labiovelar consonants. Yeah. So this uh, idea is, I think, usually associated with, I'm not sure, maybe polyglot or Yakantov. I'm not sure. But uh, he wrote about it first. So uh, let me just make sure. Does everyone 
has everyone followed what it's about? Yeah. The, the, the reconstruction of labio bullis. So, so in, so there's two kinds of hooko in middle Chinese, right? Depending on what rhymes they go with. One, one kind is restricted to velar initials. Yeah. Yeah, you can explain. <laughs> yeah, so all right, like, I mean, this is a, uh, uh, like, if we have a syllable in all in middle Chinese, like Huang, sorry, Huang, Huang, it goes, it goes back always to Tong, yeah, this one. So middle Chinese Huan always goes back to Ton. That's called the rounded vowel hypothesis. We haven't gotten to it yet, yeah. But uh, Huan has two sources. Okay. Uh, this yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is Yakuntov, the yeah. round vowel. Okay. So, uh, so Kwan can come from two things, either from Kon, same same as this one, or Kwan, yeah, yeah. where the W moves upstairs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, this idea is Ojikur. Yeah. Yeah. He he's the one who invented this idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, and I think this this thing he's not so famous for actually. I think yeah, uh, he kind of said it as a in a long article. He said, "Oh, maybe this is true." So uh, anyhow, so this is an idea that we still use that old Chinese had labio velar consonants, not just velar. Yeah, so old Chinese had both. Uh, like old Chinese had both plain velars and labial velars, right? Old Chinese had both uh, plain velars and labial velars. Yeah, this this one in hoko syllables, and this one in both haiko and haiko and and some hoko. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's Audrey Kaur's idea. Did I? Oh, I hadn't put it up there, maybe. Anyhow, now it's. No, now this is the next one. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So he. So now uh, something about Vietnamese that doesn't need to detain us very long. But he showed that the tones of Vietnamese correspond to segments in uh, related languages to Vietnamese. And in particular, that one tone came from final S and another tone came from glottal stop. Mm -hmm. So in one paper, he wrote this only about the history of Vietnamese inherited words. So so uh, uh, what's Vietnamese? Is, is, uh, is it Kradai? What language family is Vietnamese? Uh, <laughs> anyhow, it, it, languages like Rook, which is related to Vietnamese but doesn't have tones, it has this S and this glottal stop where Vietnamese has a rising tone or falling tone. Yeah, and, and then it works for Vietnamese inherited words so why not try the same hypothesis for chinese words loaned into vietnamese so then he proposed that uh, the chusheng comes from final s uh, and yeah and then he's famous for this but we know that uh georg von der goblins actually no it was it was not goblins it was conradi he proposed it first. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just go back, right? So so he proposed it based on the word for goose. Uh, and then Audrey Kaur, oops, here, proposes it 
based on these correspondences with the Vietnamese. So it's a much better reason. And uh, I think he's justly very famous for this. Uh, and the whole study of the origin of tone uh, was kind of started by Audricour. Yeah, okay. So that's it for Audricour. And then next we get to Edwin Polyblank. And he was a very productive scholar and lived uh, to be quite old. So he has many ideas. So I'm not going to list them all. Yeah. Um, but uh, the one I notice here is what Baxter later called the RJ hypothesis. And this idea is that Chongnyu Division 3, so uh, Chongnyu Sangdeng, originally had a medial R. So now, just to put the pieces together, right? This guy, Georg van der Gabelens, he said that, it, let's say, in effect, he said, it's a little bit simpler what he actually said, he said that the R dung had the medial R, right? Uh, but then, holy blank, he said, whoops, he said that the Chong Yusan Sang yeah, has the medial R. Okay. So now we're starting to get Chinese like we know it today, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other important contribution of his that I would like to point out is he noticed uh, some Shishak contact between uh, Imu and Dingmu. And I don't know how to say this one. Chung, okay. Uh, Chengmu. And he originally reconstructed these as yeah. It's not such a good idea. Uh, so now we reconstruct it as an L, love. Yeah. Uh, and you can, or maybe if I can say a little digression, right? Uh, the the Laimu comes from an R, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, so when people first thought about it, they thought the Laimu probably comes from an L because Laimu is an L, yeah? So it was because of that that he thought, oh, I need to find something else than L, yeah? Uh, but now we decide, okay, Laimu comes from R, so then the L can make this, uh, this Imu in uh, type B syllables, uh, so basically in Sandong, and then... Uh, it becomes D in type A syllable, so in uh, E dung and R dung, and well, it gets complicated with the Chongyu stuff, but anyhow. And then uh, I just want to point out, I think now, sort of in the 1960s, when Polyblank proposed this, it can be thought of as a conjecture, like maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. But now we have evidence from Hua Shang dialect, where they say this word uh, earth, D, they say Li, yeah. So it's, I think, strong evidence that uh, Li Blank was right, or let's say that this location contact between Imu and Dingmu actually does come from L, right? It's, uh, now I think it's, in his day, it was a smart idea, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. I think now we we can be totally sure it's right that this comes from an L. Okay. Now, uh, later in his life, he maybe let's say after 1980, maybe, he starts to think strange things. Yeah. So I, I, I would say, I would say, read Polly Blank from 1960 to 1980, not after 1980. Uh, so, like, one of the strange things he thinks is that Old Chinese has only two vowels. So nobody believes it, except he has one student who believes it, yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah, just be a little bit careful when you read things by Pully Blank, yeah. And he's also very grumpy, wrote very mean book reviews. Okay, so that's uh, it for, let's say... I mean, in the simplest term, that's it for people who have 
already died. Yeah. So now I will talk about, uh, well, some people who have died and some people who haven't, <laughs> but, but more recent scholars uh, with the six vowel hypothesis. And now I'll just say that uh, the six vowel hypothesis is too complicated for me to talk about today. Yeah. So I think that here in Shaman, most people believe the six vowel hypothesis. Is it true? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but of course, in Beijing, people don't believe it. Yeah. So. Uh, so uh, in, yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, and so, some people in Taipei still don't believe it, I think. Yeah. Uh, I believe it, but I find it very hard to explain to students. Yeah. So I think that, um, well, let me just back up and say three people thought of it at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Zhang Zhang Changfeng, I think, was probably the first. Yes. Uh, and then Sergei Starostin and uh, Bill Baxter. And now both Starostin and Baxter were working from uh, work of uh, Sergei Yakontov. No, uh, that's not his name. What was Yakontov's name? Anyhow, y Yakontov. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the fact that Starostin and Baxter came up with the same idea is not a coincidence because they were starting from the same uh, starting point. Right. They both start from uh, from Yakontov, yeah. Uh, but I don't know if Zhang Zhongshangfeng knew Yakontov's work. I think probably he didn't in the 60s, yeah. He didn't. Yeah, he didn't know. So we can say at least two independent mm -hmm. discoveries of uh, the six vowel theory and maybe three independent discoveries. So I think that alone suggest is right, you know, like uh, Newton and Leibniz discovered calculus at the same time, it means it's probably right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really struggle to find a simple, clear way to teach the six vowel hypothesis. So if you have some, uh, you know, advice, I would be very uh, grateful. And I think, which I say here, I think it would be really nice if someone wrote a small book where they just explain, you know, uh, how did uh, Zhang Zhang Shangfeng discover it? How did uh, Baxter discover it? How did um, uh, Darostin discover it? Maybe this is a good place to mention also that uh, Baxter's teacher is Nicholas Bodman. And somehow they discovered it together, I think, yeah, somehow. But uh, Baxter is the one who wrote the big book, whereas Bodman didn't. He, he, they, they were working together, right? Uh, and then uh, in Shaman, of course, I have to think about that Bodman, his first book was a grammar of Shaman dialect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. so, so um, I've checked it out of the library, but I didn't learn uh, Shaman dialect, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that's, uh, you know, I think this also you probably, most of you learned the six vowel hypothesis, so you probably know about these guys, yeah. Okay, so uh, now is when I actually talk about people who are still alive. And, you know, I don't know, I, I, I decided who to talk about, who not to talk about there is some uh, extent it's arbitrary, right? Like, uh, I don't talk very much about Jerry Norman, but it doesn't mean I don't like him, right? Um, <laughs> but, but these are, maybe this is the way to put it. These are the scholars in the West who I have uh, used a lot in my own work. Okay, so there's uh, Baxter and Cigar, then there's Axel Schussler, and then there's W.S. Koblenz, and I go through them one at a time. So uh, this is, uh, well, this is Laurent Cigar, and this is uh, Bill Baxter. And this is them at the uh, award for the Bloomfield Prize. So their book in 2014 called Old Chinese, A New Reconstruction, it won a really big prize. Yeah. <laughs> so 
So this is them when they mm. got the prize. Yeah, so uh, so just a few words about their reconstruction. It's based on a wide range of evidence. So, you know, say, I mean, just to review, usually when we reconstruct Old Chinese, we use Middle Chinese, the rhymes in the Shijing, and the uh, Sheshan connections, right? So they use these three, but they also add uh, loan words into Kradai and Mengmian and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also use paleography. Um, so their new Chinese is uh, typologically consistent with other Sino-Tibetan languages. Yeah, so it has syllables like sprang and plak and whatnot. Yeah, like Tibetan or like Old Burmese or something. Uh, but we can so what to say? It, it's it's good. I like it. I use it. I'm friends with them. Yeah, I respect them. But I also can complain a little bit. Yeah. So it's not very clear why they reconstruct a given word a given way. Yeah. Like, why is it this word is this one? Like, why is this one uvular, this one velar? Why does this one end in R? You, they don't tell me. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to use. Yeah. And also very complicated. So you have things like with yeah, like like or something. Little little strange, maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's right, but it needs to be kind of studied more, I would say. Yeah. Anyhow, that's them. So next I go to Axel Schussler. And Axel Schussler, there's no photograph of him. I've I've met him. So I know he has a face, yeah, uh, <laughs> but nowhere on the internet is a picture of him. And I even I emailed him. I said, look, I'm going to give a talk at Shaman Dashue. I have a picture of everyone else, yeah? And he said, I don't give you a picture. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I have a picture of his book. Yeah. So I would say, let's say, when when Westerners come to me and they say, oh, old Chinese is so difficult, it's so complicated, how can I know, like, how to reconstruct something? This person says, you know, like, Wang Li says this, and Zhang Zhang says this, and Pao Wen Yun says this. It's so confusing. Yeah. I say, use Schuffler, because it's, it's very easy to use. Yeah. And... He belongs to the sixth vowel school. So, uh, so it's, yeah, so it's easy to use, yeah. But those things that are controversial about Baxter and Thagar, he doesn't include, yeah. So for instance, he doesn't have uvulars. He doesn't have so many prefixes. He doesn't have final R. So it's a kind of uh, simple old Chinese, yeah. Uh, so it's, I think, useful for people who aren't professionals. Yeah, if you're a, a, a linguist who works on another language, you just want to check what's all the old Chinese. I think his books are really useful. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also when I have to reconstruct old Chinese, I usually start with Schussler, and then I ask myself, what would Factor and Cigar do? Yeah. But if I start with Schussler, it saves me a lot of time. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for Schussler. I will say he he doesn't really, uh, let's say, I mean, I, I don't mean this to insult him. I think he would agree, but he doesn't have any big ideas himself. He's not trying to have big ideas. He's trying to tell you what everyone agrees about. Yeah. Okay, so that's Axel Schussler. Uh, and then uh, next is uh, W.S. Koblen. 
So Koblen, uh, when he started out as a young scholar, he was working like everyone else, like uh, trying to reconstruct using Shishan series, for example. Yeah. So he wrote one article about Shushan, uh, and he worked a lot on the Han dynasty. But then in the 90s, he decided all of this uh, Yunjing, Cheyun, it's stuck. He doesn't like it anymore. Yeah. So he only uses Chinese dialects. So, uh, and tries to figure out using just the comparative method. How can I reconstruct old Chinese using no evidence from philology, only from dialects? And I think it's a very important thing to happen, right? I, like, I think, of course, we should look at the Yunjing and the Cheyun, but maybe it is very useful to try to reconstruct old Chinese just from the dialect. And then you see what it looks like, right? And then you can compare what information you lose. So he's been doing that uh, since the 90s, basically. And he's done it for several varieties, gun, uh, I don't know, that's the one that comes to my mind. But he's done about four or five books, uh, mostly published by Academia Sinica. Yeah. Uh, and I think I have PDFs of all of them. So if you want, I can give them to you, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing he does is works with alphabetic representations of Chinese. So like the Mengu Zui, Zui Yin, Yun. Yeah, he has a book about the uh, East Han. Eastern Han sound glosses. Yeah, that's sort of like there's two W.F. Koblen. There's young W.S. Koblen and old W.F. Koblen. And this Eastern Han sound loss is, is the young one. Yeah. So he doesn't like this book anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's also, it's before the six vowel theory. So he stuck very close to uh, Li Fang Kui's reconstruction. So this book has lots of good data, but it's very hard to use. I think someone needs to do it all again. Yeah. But, but now he works only on dialects and on uh, alphabetic representations. So uh, he looks a lot of missionary dictionaries like Morrison's dictionary. Oh, uh, Portuguese missionaries in the 17th century. So he looks very closely like, uh, you know, uh, this is what is in Basiba script. This is what is this missionary. And like, he's written a lot about this. We were talking about earlier, like, when did Nya, when did Nya change to Re, what part of the country? Very detailed work uh, that's a little bit boring to read, but uh, very useful, yeah. Yeah, so here I say, uh, I think if, uh, he makes a significant step towards understanding the development of Chinese into its different dialects. And then he's now quite old. He's still he's still healthy. He's still active. You can send him an email. He writes back. Uh, but he's quite old, and he's not doing so much anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I ask myself, who still works in this tradition? Right? And the person who comes to my mind, but maybe you know other people, is uh, Shen Reiting in in uh, Singapore. So he, uh, in particular, has been working on reconstruction of proto-min, yeah? Uh, and I think this is, I don't know, for, uh, for me, the thing I want most to know is what proto-min, because uh, <laughs> Baxter and Sagar use min in their reconstruction, uh, but they use min from, like, the 1970s, like, very old work on min by Jerry Norman. So I think one thing that uh, we need now is a new complete reconstruction of Proto Min so that then we can use that in old Chinese. And uh, I'm hoping uh, that we will have in Dublin this year, 
a series of online talks, maybe four or five, about uh, Min dialects. So uh, if you're in Dublin, maybe you can come. <laughs> but otherwise, we will record them and put them on Bilibili as well. Um, and if you know some people working on reconstruction of Proto Min who I don't know, yeah, then please uh, tell me. Okay, so that's uh, it for the older generation of currently active scholars. And now I move on to uh, the younger generation. Yeah, and now I would say I'm this generation. Also, Professor Ye, I think, is still young. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the West, I think there are three mm, things I want to draw your attention to. The first one is what I call the Paris School. So the Paris School, they mostly work on Jarong, but also on Old Chinese. And then I want to talk about the use of uh, computer methodologies, like digital humanities, computational methodologies in the study of Old Chinese. And then uh, I will end by talking about the philology of excavated text. Okay. Is it working so far? Like most people understand most of it? Yeah. I think. Okay. <laughs> you can always ask a question. If... <laughs> Okay, well, then I'll go on. Yeah, go on. Okay. So uh, then first I talk about the Paris school. So uh, I misspelled his name. Sorry about that. <laughs> so don't, don't take a picture. It's a misspelling. Anyhow, so the Paris school is led by Guillaume Jacques. Guillaume Jacques is not exactly true to say he's a student of Laurent Sagar because Laurent Sagar did not supervise his PhD dissertation, but we can think of him as a student of Laurent Sagar. Uh, and his uh, primary focus is on the Gyarong languages of Sichuan. So he worked on Jacques Gyarong uh, and wrote a big, grammar uh, like two years ago about Jacob Gerum. And also his students, like two of his students are in Dublin with me, uh, Lai Yunfan and uh, Zhang Chuya. They also both work on Gyaron. His student uh, Gong Shun in Vienna, he also worked on Gyaron. So lots of people working on Gyaron now. <laughs> and, and they're all somehow from Paris. Yeah. But they, they also work on Old Chinese. And the goal is to contextualize Old Chinese as a Sino-Tibetan language. So they actually have, for instance, a very nice paper from a few years ago uh, uh, about cognates between Gyarong and Old Chinese. Yeah. So, and I think this is this is really a nice development because, in general, people who work on Tibeto-Burman languages they don't know any Chinese. Yeah. And people who work on Chinese, they don't know any Tibeto-Burman languages. So I think this has been a big problem that uh, Chinese is one thing and Tibeto-Burman is another thing. So I think the Paris school is really helping to bring them together so that Chinese can help us with Tibeto-Burman and Tibeto-Burman can help us with Chinese. Of course, it has to be done carefully, right? Uh, I sometimes think Zhang Zhang Shangfeng makes Chinese too much like Tibetan, yeah. Um, Okay, so that's it for the Paris School. Now I talk about, I didn't have a name for this school, yeah? Where is it, yeah? But uh, using new methods, like fancy computer techniques, yeah? So this is uh, Johann Matas List. Uh, he was used to be in Jena, yeah? yeah. Oh. But now he's in Passau, which is in the south of Germany. Yeah. Very beautiful city, yeah. Uh, and he worked together with me. He does more work. I'm a little more lazy, yeah. Um, <laughs> but we have some papers together. Uh, yeah, and 
in particular, so we, we've tried various things, but in particular, we use techniques from biology. Uh, well, well, we got them from biology, but they're used in many different sciences, uh, network technique, network methods. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I could give a whole talk about it, so I won't. Uh, but simply put, like, uh, if you have a friend, like, I don't know, if you have, like, on uh, WeChat, you're friends with someone, you can understand it as, I mean, like, just here's one person, here's another person, and then they're friends, right? So one person, another person, and they're friends, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you can also think of it as one character and another character, and they rhyme. Yeah. And if you use this formalization, there's all kinds of software tools just available, like uh, that are used in the study of social network. Also, many other things like planning a subway system. Yeah. Or uh, any kind of network. There's a whole science of network theory. So we don't study network theory, but we use some little pieces of network theory to study uh, old Chinese. So like I say, I have some, there are some talks on Billy Billy, uh, but I just show you the, the proof that there are talks on Billy Billy, yeah? Okay, so here's, here's one talk. Oh. This talk is from a long time ago now, maybe 2013 or something, yeah? Using network models to analyze old Chinese rhyme data. So this is Matis. You can see he was much younger, right? Here's he's, this is him this year. This is him uh, in 2013. Yeah. Uh, this is where he first proposes to use uh, network theory. So if if you are new to the idea of network theory, it's a good start. He talks very slowly through what is a network. How do you do network theory? Okay, so moving ahead now. Oh, oh, this was 2016. I said it right there, not 2013, 2016. Okay, so now I have a project in London where I have a postdoc. Actually, uh, here he is, uh, Julian Bailey. He's French, and he's actually a software engineer at Microsoft. So he's very good at computers. It's really nice. Uh, and this one is called Networks as a Tool for the Study of Chinese Rhymes. Yeah. And this is very small, but these are all of the poems in the song and the song. <laughs> uh, all of the shirt sure poems. Yeah. Not. Yeah. Uh, and then the different colors are the different uh, rhyme categories that the computer recognizes. Yeah. Uh, and then he has a, a new uh, uh, talk just from last year uh, called Evaluating Rhyme Annotations for Large Corpora. So uh, if you can use the computer to decide oh, this rhymes, this rhymes, but then you have to check, is it right what the computer did, right? And it's hard because if I have to check everything, it doesn't save me any time to use the computer, right? So he's trying to find a way to estimate how good the computer has performed, yeah? And we have a couple papers out soon, like in maybe next three months, next six months, some papers about uh, using network theory to study old Chinese. and. Uh, uh, Julian has mostly worked on the tongue and the song because the data is, you just, you know, just go online, you get the data. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not so interested in the tongue and the song. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to get him to work on the Han and, uh, the warring states, but it's the, not so much uh, data. Yeah. And not as convenient the data. So we're still working on collecting the data in a convenient way for the computer to read. Okay, so those are, you know, these are just, say, these are three, three talks about 
network theory that you can watch on Billy Billy if you want. Uh, and this is the work that we're doing in London. So I'm in Ireland, but I still have one research project in London. So this is the research project in London. And I'm realizing I'm probably talking too fast. I try to slow down again. Um, okay, so that was, you know, just to, to review what I was going to talk about Oops, here. So these three, so the Paris school, the use of network methods, and then philology of excavated text. So then we talked about the Paris school, and then we talked about uh, network methods. So now we talk about the philology of excavated text. So this is not something I know anything about. You know much more about it than I do, yeah. Uh, but I think it's extremely important, right? Like uh, something like rhyme data. Every day we get new discoveries with text, with rhymes, with text, with Tongja. So it, you know, it's really a good time to be working on old Chinese. Very exciting. Every day, new things, right? So I just mentioned here some of my favorite authors uh, who work in uh, excavated philology who write in English. Yeah. So there's Ed Shaughnessy at University of Chicago. He's a little bit old nowadays. Uh, oh, really? Two years ago, yeah. He's well. Then you know him. I, like I was very lucky. He came to. Uh, he was in Munich for a year, maybe two years, and during this time he came to London maybe three, four times. So I saw him there, and as you know, he's just very elegant. Yeah, very elegant man. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, very charming. Very, uh, yeah, and also his like his work is really good. Like. He has a book on uh, Jinwen. It's the kind of the, you know, in in English there's two books. One is a, uh, one is about Jagwen and it's by David Keatley, uh, and then the one about Jinwen is by Shaughnessy, and it's really very nice book. Um, yeah. That's why I come to Stanford University. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, and then. The next person I mentioned is Ren Spiegsman. And he was at, uh, he's a young guy. I mean, uh, look at him, my age. Uh, did his PhD at Oxford. And he was at Wuhan for a couple of years. Uh, but now he moved to Tsinghua. And I think he also does really just, whenever I read something by him, I feel really happy. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then uh, Scott Cook. You probably know he's he worked on the Gordian, wrote a big two volume book about uh, the Gordian, uh, and he works at in Singapore. Kind of I don't understand Yale NSU is somehow Yale in Singapore. Yeah, uh, but anyhow, and he mostly writes now in Chinese. So his early works were in English, but now I think mostly he writes in Chinese. Uh, and then another person I like is Adam Smith. Don't confuse him with the economist from the 18th century. He's a different Adam Smith. Yeah, do, do you all know? Adam Smith is a very famous British economist from the 18th century. But this is different Adam Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he's an English guy who works in America at the University of Pennsylvania. And he works, I guess, on Jaguen mostly, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, because uh, when I was in Beijing in 2019, in December, people told me that uh, Anhui Dashui had come out with this new uh, searching, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then it hadn't been published yet, or it maybe just been published. But I said, can you give me the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so then uh, uh, I asked Adam to write a, a book review for uh, uh, BSOA, this uh, journal that I'm uh, uh, associated with. Yeah. 
And so he wrote a very long, very nice book review about this uh, Anhui uh, bridging. Yeah. And then I'll also tell you, tell you that if you want to write a book review about a book that's good book that came out in China about Chinese historical chronology, please let me know and maybe I can arrange for you to publish also a book review about in the BSOAS is the, the, the journal, I'll write it. Bulletin of the School of Oriental and African Studies. Yeah. BSOAS is it's a journal, yeah. Uh, and it's pretty good, not, not top top, but kind of pretty good journal. <laughs> uh, and I'm trying to get more reviews about uh, things from China. So those are my favorite scholars writing in English about the philology of excavated texts. Now, what would I say? Is, so I think that the philology of excavated texts is one of the few areas where Western Sinologists are competitive with people in Chinese in China. I don't say they're better or which one's better, it's not the point, but I think they do good work, right? Whereas for something like Ming history, forget about it, yeah? People in the West are useless. You, the best is in China, right? I think for Song, for Ming, uh, for Kong, the best work is always in China. But my sense is that in early China, some people in the West are worth reading. That's my, I don't know what you think. That's my uh, stance is there's still useful work being done in the West in early China. And then younger scholars, someone like Adam Smith or Renz Kriegman, they start to pay attention to historical chronology. So I would say Shaughnessy, he doesn't care. Yeah. Uh, but like Scott, Cook and Rance, they, they, they know Baxter and Sagar's work, yeah, and they try to use it a little bit. So I think it's a really good development, yeah. But I think it's still a big gap between the linguists and the philologists. Like just even the IPA symbols, the 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 phonologists, they they don't they look at IPA, they say, oh, it's not so nice. So I think it start, we start to get some working together between philologists and uh, linguists, but it's a very slow process. And uh, maybe, you know, maybe your generation, you can do it, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that this, you know, let's say Baxter and Cigar, they try to use uh, some philology of excavated text, but not very much. Uh, whereas the philologists like Rance Kriegman or Adam Smith, they try to use a little bit of historical chronology, but they don't use it very much. Yeah. And actually, I think, you know, if I can say, I think one thing I really uh, admire about Professor Ye is she really does both historical phonology and the philology of excavated texts. And I think this is extremely rare. So you're lucky to be able to study with her. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's the whole of my discussion of the history of Chinese historical linguistics in the West.